Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to hand you over to Stephen now. Thank you, Chair. So, members, you're hereby summoned to attend the monthly meeting of Business and Culture to be held hybrid uh, physically in the Guildhall and via WebEx. Um, so, if I do the roll, uh, Alderman Morris Devaney. Here, Stephen. Alderman Ryan McCready. Here. All night. Alderman David Ramsey. Apologies, Stephen. Councillor Jason Barr. Here, Stephen. Councillor Sean Carr. Here, Stephen. Councillor Sean Cusack. Here. Councillor Gary Donnelly. Shot. Councillor Rory Farrell. Here. Uh, Councillor Sean Harkin. Here. Councillor Connor Heaney. Shot. Sure. Councillor Patricia Loeb. Councillor John McGowan. Shot. Sure. Councillor Kieran McGuire. And Councillor Lillian C. Now Barr. Yes, David. Thank you, members. Okay, I want to read out the broadcasting statement, folks. I would like to remind everyone present that this meeting will be broadcast live to the internet and will be capable of repeated viewing. This webcast may be terminated or suspended in accordance with our protocol. If you're seated in the lower public seating media areas, it is possible that the recording cameras will capture your image and this will result in the possibility that your image will become part of the broadcast. This may infringe your human and data protection rights, and if you wish to avoid this, you should move to the upper gallery. Okay, moving on to declarations of members' interests, I want to declare that in the presentation that uh, I am one of the organisations within the slides uh, that's involved in the hub, so I just wanted to say that. Is anyone else? Sure. Just to declare an address in item nine, just as uh, I work on the employability sector. So. Okay. So we'll move on to item five now and take the deputation uh, for the Community Wealth Development Hub. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, John. Thank you very much, Stephen. I think I can be heard okay. Volume is just a little bit low. If you can maybe turn it up. Is that working any better for you? Yeah, it's a bit. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. okay. I'll try and lean a little bit closer to you, um, to the screen then. So thanks, Chair. Thanks, John. Thanks, Stephen, for the invitation and members uh, for um, for the opportunity to present to you this afternoon on work that we've been needing on community wealth building. So we, we've sent you a presentation and there's a lot of information in the presentation that I think many of the members are already aware of. So we're not going to dwell um, an awful lot on the first half of the presentation. But if we could just maybe begin to move through the slides quickly, that we can get to the point of the presentation that we want to uh, to speak um, and hopefully take questions on, which is around the wealth building hub for dairy. So if we can move to the next slide, please. And the next slide, please. Okay, so why community wealth building? I mean, so our articulation really is that we need to, uh, in the north, focus on how we can build and strengthen the economy from from within, uh, rather than sim uh, simply, I suppose, or singularly focusing our hopes on continued inward investment. Um, our wealth building approach is much more strategic in terms of thinking about local economic development, and the aim of the approach that we're championing is to increase the flow of wealth back into our local economies. And then building wealth from within, you know, we're moving from, uh, from an extractive model of economic development and uh, focusing on creating decent jobs, more diverse ownership, and a broader use of land and assets. And as it says there, the focus is on generative wealth building rather than extractive. Um, economic development practice and, and consequently then addressing some of our outstanding and major issues around economic and social justice and then progress, I suppose, then we will say and what we're trying to do and what hopefully what we're trying to do in, in Derry is 
is that um, you know we're generating good and better lives through the growth of GDP through the approach that we're we're taking. Um, can we move to the next slide then, please? Five principles. You'll all be aware of these. We've been doing this work in this space for the past five years now with the Centre for Local Economic Strategies in Manchester. Who I think some of you had a recent presentation from in the last uh, matter of weeks. And the focus there is on, on those five principles around fair employment and just labour markets, a more plural ownership of the economy, considerations around how we make financial power work for local places, progressive procurement of goods and services, and a more socially just use of land and property. And I'll not go into the detail on that, but we, will, we can pick it up later. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So you'll be aware of, I suppose, the, the background to some of this in, in its current sort of format. The Democracy Collaborative have been leading the charge in terms of developing the narrative and the methodology and practice around wealth building. And their work in Cleveland, Ohio, um, stands out as, as, as one of the, I suppose, the exemplars in terms of new practice. Next slide, please. And in Lancashire, in uh, Northwest England, and we, um, most of you will have heard that as the work of Preston uh, City Council and how it has taken the principles of community wealth building and utilised those to turn their economy uh, by looking inward rather than looking outward. Next slide, please. On a broader scale, then, some of the, the bigger uh, public um, anchor organisations in England uh, have also been involved in, in looking at their land, their assets, their spend, their procurement process. And a significant work then has been done through the, the Anchor Network in Birmingham, um, again, uh, utilising a, a, a community wealth building approach. And next slide, please. And then I think more recently, obviously, the standout sort of progress in this space across the UK has been the work in, in Scotland, where they now have a, a Minister for Community Wealth and Public Finance, Tom Arthur, and they're now in the beginnings of uh, preparing a white paper for a Community Wealth Building Act to in, in embed the principles of that within its macro economy, but also its outworkings already are, are taking place across its um, uh, uh, micro economy of, of a number of um, uh, local government authorities. So next question or next slide, please. And uh, yeah, I suppose it's evident in other places in, in the UK as well. The foundational economy approach uh, in Wales is, is another good um, um, example uh, of the outworkings of community wealth building in practice. Next slide, please. So we were charged with taking forward a program over the past year and a bit. Uh, we delivered a lot of public uh, conversations, a lot of online meetings, a lot of detailed and direct um, engagement with 50 community anchor organizations and we conference in community wealth building. We did some direct action learning sets with departmental officials and with other local government officials as well. Again, just, you know, um, talking about what community wealth building meant to us and, and trying to generate a, a better understanding of it uh, across the public sector in the north. Next slide, please. And where we've got to today, we've, we've our research, our detailed research uh, we're now we now have five supplementary papers that we have that we are currently in, in the process of printing. Three of those are done to have yet to be done, and they take the work that we we did with the fifty organisations and gives us a very stronger sort of written narrative around the context for action across each of these pillars with a series of recommendations. For example, around what needs to be done. So the slide you're looking at now is really it's it's the executive summary of the executive summary. It takes those five pillars. And it sets out a series of proposals uh, for intervention uh, going forward. So, for example, on assets, it'll not surprise you uh, to hear that we're talking about legislation is needed to support asset transfer, including for the wider uh, sort of society, the right to buy and the right to challenge general disposal consent is also, we would say, needed, particularly for local government and other community planning partners when considering the use of their land and property assets and particularly the disposal of those. We need financial accounting guidance for the disposal for officers as well. We need a comprehensive register and we need, you know, more bespoke, you know, linking capital and revenue finance that will support asset based development. On the economy, we're saying that we need to think about how we restructure deprived places by building a workable, sustainable and more locally embedded economy in which the social economy plays an anchor role. 
you know, we need to deliver financial comprehensive or co sorry, comprehensive financial management and skills program uh, to that sector. We need to look at where it is that we're doing stuff really, really well within the third sector, how we can replicate and how we can scale high impact community businesses. We need to do maybe an experiment with space and interventions such as community wealth building hubs and social enterprise zones. And that's some of the work we're trying to take forward in, in the Northwest. And my colleague Paul will talk to you that in a minute. On the grounds or on the area around procurement, for example, Again, it's about strengthening the investment and the contract readiness of social enterprise organizations and their capacity to innovate to address local problems through a community wealth building approach. And then that we need to redesign the structure size and types of contracts where social value is a priority. So there's there's lots of work to be done, but that sort of basically summarizes, you know, where we're at now and the advocacy that we continue to take forward on behalf of uh the adoption of a community wealth building approach across local government uh, in the north. Next slide, please. And we continue then to work uh, in, 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 in the year ahead. We continue to provide support for the ministerial advisory panel appointed by the Minister for Communities. And we're doing broader work on the ground as well. Next slide, please. So. I suppose part of our ask and presentation for you today is talk about the wealth building hub in, in, in Derry. And at this point, I want to pass you over to, to my colleague, Paul, who has been doing some work on the ground on this one. Paul. You're on mute, Paul. It's always a good idea to unmute. Um, okay, so as, as part of our, our program of work for this year, uh, one of the things that we'll be doing is de developing two pilot, what we're called, calling community wealth building hub. Um, and these certainly have the potential to develop, to become a, a very important structure in the delivery of community wealth building. I mean, we're not coming up with a hard structure for the, the hubs, but we're saying, you know, each hub will decide what it wants to achieve and how to do it. Uh, the goal is to deliver a fairer and more equitable society, which is what community wealth building is about. Each of the two hubs in the Northeast and the Northwest ha have agreed the following four outcomes. Because above all, I mean, above all, this is an economic intervention. It is about trying to change the economy so that it works better for people. So the first of those is to build a a stronger local economic e ecosystem, then to develop the local social enterprise and cooperative in infrastructure. And that's about developing more plural economy, giving more people a stake in the economy. It's also about developing agreed plans and initiatives to deliver community wealth building um, and to work jointly with statutory agencies, like yourselves, obviously, and in Derry Straban Council to deliver on the five pillars uh, of community wealth building. So if we go on to the next slide, we pull together the what we call community anchor organizations. And I mean, the infrastructure in Derry is, is pretty unique. Well, Derry, Derry, in that you do have very strong social enterprises, development trusts with a good asset base. So this, I mean, this infographic is based on on roughly half the organizations that we have involved in the hub so and with the figures that have to go in all, all these figures will more than double so you can see what i mean we are i mean with the five organizations we're talking about a, a turnover of 5.2 million asset value of 15 and a half million and 113 jobs uh primarily from people from the the most deprived areas so social enterprises make a real impact in those areas which need it most. Uh, we could go on to the next slide, please. So we've got these community anchor organizations coming together. They're making a real difference in communities. And I'm sure, I mean, you obviously come across all these organizations every day. You know, Derek Straban is extremely strong for social enterprises. You know, you have, you have organizations like the inner city trust, which is a you know a huge asset owning or owning organization, uh, which owns a lot of property within Derry. Um, 
So I suppose we're talking about what asks we would have. Uh, it's to recognize the strength of the community or anchor organizations as a major player in the local economy and to support them in their work. Up to now, there have, I mean, social enterprises and development trusts have tended to operate independently and they haven't had meaningful interaction with the council. You know, we want to develop a meaningful social enterprise strategy. We want, we want to work jointly with uh, the local authority on plans and projects that are going to improve the lives of local people. We all have the same goals in mind. Another thing is, there's, I mean, there have been a lot of changes now around procurement. And so there is greater access to procurement opportunities for social enterprises. But then on the supply side, there is work that needs to be done around the capacity of, of social enterprises and community anchor, anchors to access the procurement opportunities that are being created. And I think the council has a very important role to play in that in working with the social enterprises. Then as Charlie mentioned, for us, that is hugely important. Um, so community asset transfer, and you know we have a community asset transfer framework which makes it almost impossible, but, but that is going to be changed. Uh, and obviously, Derry Strabane Council also has assets that it, that it should be auditing and seeing if there's better use for some of those that could be, that could allow community anchors to access community asset transfer opportunities, whether that's on, you know, short, medium, long-term leases uh, or outright transfer. The final one then is, is just a general one that about that joint work and about it supporting inclusive and sustainable economic growth to create more successful places. And that's what the Community Wealth Building Hub intends to do. And we would like the participation and collaboration uh, of Derry Straban Council. I'll just okay. pass the now. If I can just maybe add into that, and just to say that elsewhere across the UK for local government and central government that have been picking up in community wealth building, the approach has been initiated and supported by action planning. Uh, at a local government level, and, and we ourselves have been working with Neary Morning Down District Council over the past couple of years, and the class as well, to support them to the, prepare an action plan to think about their approach to community wealth building. So if I can just maybe invite my colleague Margaret to come in at this point and just give us a little bit of background on that. Margaret. Okay, thanks, Charlie. Um, yeah, we've been working with Neary Morning Down Council for around two years now. We were working on inclusive local economies with them. And the council quickly realized the benefits of community wealth building, the principles of community wealth building could bring to the district. But what they asked of us was, you know, where do we start? You know, how, how do we build community wealth building into um, the work that we do here in the council and the work that other people do across the district? So um, they commissioned us and we worked with CLES. We commissioned CLES to um, carry out a diagnostic exercise with the council. So um, over the last four to six months, we, um, we've we been interviewing people from the council. We started with the senior management team. We worked with the uh, corporate services team. Then we went to the directors, the assistant directors. We interviewed the councillors. We also interviewed um, community stakeholders through their, they have, in Newry Morning Down, they have a strategic stakeholders forum and we also interviewed members of the um the chamber of commerce and local traders associations so we took all that information and together with looking at the policies and procedures of newry morning down council we looked at all of those through the lens of community wealth building and summarized all that in a report so that report is with um newry morning down council at the minute and in that there's five pretty straightforward simple recommendations which um we're not saying to the council that you have to make any big major changes. It's just looking at how you do things, looking at how you do things more efficiently. But most importantly, is how do you use the lever, the levers of community wealth building to really drive the, all of the recommendations and the plans that you have across Newry Morning Down. So as I say, that reports with the council with the um, senior management team at the moment and it's hopefully going to be going to council to be ratified in their august meeting so once that's ratified and the council agree that then we could share that with um any officers or members of derry Straban district council if that's what you need thanks margaret 
Uh, we share that information with you because we appreciate that it is a local government authority for the Northwest. It may be something that you're interested in scoping out in terms of considering, well, what's the action plan um, that Derry City's Strabane District Council wants to develop to take forward its um, interest in community wealth building. So we're sharing with that with you as, in, as information and, and happy to take a response from, from you on that. But essentially, I suppose it's like what Paul and Margaret have both said, like, We've initiated um, and pulled together eight organizations, eight community anchor organizations who are 30 and 40 years um, in the making, who are committed to Derry as a place to remain are central to public service and to regeneration in the economy of the place. And, and we think, you know, that there is a, this, there is a, a unique opportunity to work strategically with them through the Community Wealth Building Hub and for the council to participate in that process as well. And for us to begin to think around what interventions we can collectively agree that will help us to um, mutually, if you like, then take the agenda and community wealth building forward. So that's all. Happy to take questions, as is Margaret, as is Paul. Thank you, Charlie uh, and Paul and Margaret. And before I open it up for questions, I just want to thank you for the presentation. Uh, I also want to, you know, you know, let you know that I'm a fan of this because, you know, this city is unique. It's it's always had that self-help approach from Patty Doherty and many others initiated that here, and we're now entered a new phase. We city the city team, and I believe that uh, we need strategic partners across the community and charitable sector in the city to play a, a part on that. It just can't be all led by the private sector. So a lot of the, a lot of the things that you're talking about today, I know there's only eight in this first cluster, but uh, there are many organisations that that will hopefully join this, uh, that we can have a voice in this city for organisations that aren't just about profit, they're about the community, about creating employment, and uh, that hasn't happened before. So anything that you can do to encourage that, it's it's great. So. I'll just open it up now to the floor if anyone wants to come on. Emmett, see Emmett Doyle uh, in the chat box. I'll go to Emmett. Much appreciated, uh, Chair, and thanks to the uh, to Charlie, uh, Paul, and, and uh, Mark for coming on. Um, the, you'll, most members will probably know, and, and maybe the, our uh, visitors will also know that we are embarking on. Um, a community wealth building journey ourselves as as the district authority. Um, we passed, I think, w one motion in particular to set us down the path, but we're now progressing that on the basis that um, we are asking and have asked our officers to come back to us with a list, for example, of the top 300 um, businesses or uh, stakeholders that we use for certain levels of procurement. Um, so we're, you know, I, I'm very interested um, in the in the Preston model. And the primary reason for that is because, from a party political point of view, um, A2 see it very much as, as part of Derry's economic future uh, to, to integrate uh, community wealth building into our, uh, as part of the, uh, the economy for the next number of years. In terms of social economies, uh, Chair, I know you're an expert in this yourself, um, but it, it is refreshing to hear that there's, uh, that, there's that uh, leadership taking place in terms of uh, of those stakeholders in, in that sector, because um, I think one of the speakers said it, but we, you know, we can't be doing it alone. We can't be isolated and doing it. Um, and it's really important, I think, that we hear from uh, stakeholders um, involved in community wealth building. I would like to, to maybe uh, see a wee bit more joined up um, work in terms of how we can help each other, in terms of uh, Derry City and Spans District Council and, and maybe yourselves. Um, to ensure that we're we're not duplicating that work, because ultimately I think Belfast had tried going down a community wealth building. Sorry, Belfast City Council had tried to go down a com community wealth building uh, path at one stage, um, and it faltered for whatever reason. Um, so I think we lent, you know, I'm determined, and I think other members are to push this forward uh, for the benefit of our constituents, and we may well end up being the first uh, council in. Uh, in the north to, to fully integrate onto a community wealth building framework. So uh, really delighted to hear from you. Um, I, I know, of course, uh, Chair, I'm, I'm not a, a member of this committee, but um, I would like to maybe see if we can, um, <clears throat> whenever we do get that, that paper back um, on procurement, 
um, that we had uh, discussed uh, a while back that we could maybe um, have a conversation again with uh, with uh, Charlie, Paul and Margaret to see how that all fits in with, with their work because I think there's benefit to be had utilising the skills that uh, that those anchor organisations that uh, Charlie and Paul mentioned uh, have for the city and district. Thank you. Okay, uh, Connor Haney and then Derek. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thanks very much to the presenters uh, of the presentation. Um, <clears throat> it's not a, a question, it's just maybe just to state our position in relation to this. Uh, like we've been very supportive of this approach um, for, for quite some time, and indeed our ministers, uh, Deirdre Hargy and Connor Murphy, have also uh, pushed this agenda through their own departments in relation to social clauses and other ways of, of realising uh, community assets. So um, just to, to say that we would be very supportive of this and have no issue with uh, the asks and would be keen that that this council does develop a closer partnership working uh, relationship with yourselves. So thank you, Chair. Derek and then Sean Hargan. Uh, Chair, thanks for permission to come in. I am not a member of committee uh, and I can't get my camera going, which is probably a good thing. Charlie, Paul, Margaret, all very welcome. Um, you'll forgive me for saying a lot of the emphasis on, on what you were uh, telling us about seemed to me to be silly city based. Uh, therefore, you know, when Margaret came on, I was very much taken by what she was saying there and the development in Newry and Warren, because of course Newry and Warren does have a large rural area, uh, as well as the, the city of Newry. Um, from the work that's going on in Newry and, Newry and Warren, I would be extremely interested to find out how um, the community community wealth system is developing to embrace the rural areas. Uh, I'm mindful, for example, of you know over this past number of years, the, the the large number of rural schools that close and they just lie there derelict. Whereas there there an opportunity uh, through CIT uh, that the community could move into and redevelop hubs within rural communities. Uh, I, I admire the work being done uh, in uh, the, the city on, on what you're proposing. And I'm sure Stavan too, because uh, what you have said about Stavan and the, or, or sorry about the city and organizations equally would apply to Stavan town. But, you know, particularly with regard to the rural area, I'm a rural councillor, uh, you know, so I'll make no apology uh, for taking that line. But definitely the, the idea of uh, community wealth uh, building uh, and social enterprise, et cetera, does have the potential to change the lives of citizens in the rural area as well as the urban area. And I hope that something can be taken on board going forward. Thanks very much for the presentations. Thank you, Chair. Thanks for Sean Harkin, then we can sum up. Thank you, Chair, for letting me in, and uh, thank you to uh, all three of our presenters today. <clears throat> uh, you're more than welcome to be here, and, and I think that the discussion of community wealth building here at the Council has been very useful. Uh, for me as a socialist, it's great to see that more and more socialists are becoming uh, in favour of socialism, because that's what the community wealth building is about, uh, certainly Preston and elsewhere. Uh, and that's the one that is being held up uh, mostly as a model. So, look, I think that, as people have said, uh, Derry is famous or well known for its attempt to uh, do what central government wasn't doing, and that was to help uh, people get a foot up uh, and to take action locally where uh, it wasn't being done elsewhere. And I think that that is uh, very good, and a lot of that was led by community organisations, and we need to do, uh, we want to see that develop. Um, and, uh, and nothing has changed, or much hasn't changed, given that we're back uh, having this type of discussion uh, about community wealth building here. Um, so, look, there, there's uh, a lot of discussion now about how we address inequality, and uh, we are in favour, as people before profit, of whatever measures, um, even if we don't come up with them, or initiatives that help to reduce inequality and uh, improve workers' wages and strengthen the cohesion in communities with better services and so on. Um, so, um, you know, that's why we think this uh, endeavour that the Council is heading on is going to be uh, useful and productive. 
Um, so we, we want to see it progress and develop and to build build those relationships um, uh, as well. Uh, we we do think that um, as well as doing community wealth building, we can't uh, allow the destruction to continue of our public services. When we look at the health service uh, and, and other public services like the housing executive, it, it would not work if community wealth building was being strengthened while, while our other organisations that we as communities depend on are being allowed to uh, to be to be destroyed. So I think we have to fight uh, harder on that front to defend our public services while also um, uh, moving forward with community wealth building initiatives. And then I think within the within the sector itself, um, I think we have to make sure that uh, it's it's inclusive as possible. Um, and it's also where workers are being paid uh, a living wage um, as well, because we want that to be very much uh, a model for people um, moving moving forward. But thank you for the presentations today. I'll hand over to Stephen now. Sorry, Morris. Thank you, Chair, for allowing me in. And on behalf of the DUP, just kind of welcome Charlie, Paul, and Margaret, and thank them for the, the presentation. Uh, and look, um, a lot has been said about it here. But look, um, when you look at, at the pillars, um, they're fairly, fairly good assets, places, economy, work, and procurement. They're five very vital ones, so they are. And look, you know, I, our party, would be very open to having conversations with our council that we can work in a partnership and see what comes out of it. Uh, and, you know, it, it's all about working together and see what makeup we can come up with or design that we can come up with. But look, anything that um, keeps wealth within the community, and look, I'm a rural councillor as well, and I know we, we a lot of talk about the city down in London uh, and the town in Strabane, but look, we would like to see something, you know, mentioned in there about rural as well. But look, very, very happy to have those conversations and see what comes out of them and hope they're very positive. Thanks, Chair. Rory and then Shauna. Yeah, uh, thanks, Chair, and thanks, Charlie, Paul, uh, and Margaret, uh, for your attendance here today. Uh, on behalf of the SLP, I'd like to welcome me. And obviously, we realise the benefit uh, of community wealth building in keeping money in the local economy and making sure it's not sucked out outside of this council area. Um, we're all for building a stronger, more vibrant, and ultimately more sustainable local economy. And I've got a question, but it's not to the delegation. The question's to Stephen. You know, so there's five asks included in this report. How do those asks align with the current direction of travel that our council is pursuing in relation to community wealth building? Thank you. So uh, if I can answer that by also coming in and summing up, I mean, obviously myself and Charlie and Margaret met and and uh, we've gone through a number of initial discussions before the presentation today. Where I see the alignment um, is the direction of travel this council has clearly gone with. There's a, a motion, I mean, several uh, um, asks as well, in turn, including the top 300 procurement, but where what I see as a, a really good direction of travel is what Margaret alluded to with the work that that has been done with New and Morn, which is a complete audit of the council with that social value lens and how we can develop some actions to go forward, positive actions that, that we can take forward as a council. So what I had proposed to do or what I felt if members were content today was that I would work with Charlie, Margaret and Paul to develop a paper for September, which will outline how we take this forward, how we work with the group to develop that audit. Um, clearly there's a cost to it so that's why it would have to come back as a, as a paper but i think that positive step as to how we complete that initial piece of work will point us in the, the right direction and will actually point to several key actions that I, I believe as a council then we could take in over the next year so working closely with the group but really with that social value lens on on everything we do 
And the advantage of the audit as well is because it involves all of the councillors, all of the senior management team, so it's not just confined to business and culture, although a, a big focus will be on the economic side. It actually pulls in all of our colleagues right across all the various directorates. So that was kind of what I would like to have summed up as well, so hopefully that answers the, the question as well, Councillor Farrell, is that I'll bring forward a paper now, work in conjunction with Charlie and Margaret and Paul for consideration for September as to how we take this forward in real terms and hopefully pointing to how do we take an audit forward of this council. Okay, I don't see any other speakers. I want to thank you again, Charlie, Paul and Margaret for the presentation today. Uh, Stephen, as you heard, is going to bring a paper forward in September and we'll, we'll definitely be in contact. So thanks very much. Okay, so, thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks, members. Moving on. Yeah. Moving on to chair Pearson's business. Uh, there's a couple of things I want to say, and I know there's a couple of speakers as well. I suppose the first thing I want to say uh, from council is it's great to have the foil cup back. Uh, it's been a while. Uh, there's someone told me that hey, there's 450 teams, is it? It's a lot of teams. Um, I heard them this morning, they passed my house, so absolutely brilliant for the city. As well as that, everyone knows we have Clipper and the Foil Food Festival. I want to commend uh, Council on the Foil Food. I spoke to a number of the people this week, and uh, it's good when, when people who are along a river run out of food. It's it's not good if you're waiting in that queue, but it's, it's great to see that uh, that's, that people come out and support it, even with the weather not always being great. But the clipper, as we know, starts this week. Uh, it's great being in the city at the moment. Not if you live in the centre like me for traffic, but it's great. And I uh, just wanted to say that. Uh, I'm moving on now. I know Rory had asked to come in under chair, and then Sean Argan. Uh, yeah, thanks, thanks, chairs. And in terms of what you said, yeah, foil cup. I, I was at you know the parade. I was I was cheering the parade on as as I came down Great James Street today. And I honestly don't think I've ever seen as many people in Great James Street at one time. It must be some sort of world record. But you know, just the enthusiasm of all the young players and their parents and the singing and the dancing. And the rivalry between teams as well. So that's just a fantastic spectacle. Shame has started raining, but you know we can't control that. In terms of the Maritime Festival, you know it, it kicks off tomorrow, and you know, I think I've been down seeing the Clipper boats about five times since, since they came onto the city. Um, so you know when we look out the window, we can see the Clipper boats. We can see the preparations being made for tomorrow. So. Uh, it promises to be a fantastic festival. We've got the tall ships, we've got the markets, the food, we've got fireworks, we've got Dobie Dick. So uh, it's going to be an amazing weekend for the city. And I hope that anybody that, that comes here has a fantastic time, and I'm sure that they will. Um, but I had contacted you previously, Chair, and thanks for letting me come on on this. And I normally wouldn't heap praise on, on the Arts Council, but I'm going to do it here today. And specifically, it's about the £50,000 award uh, that the Arts Council have funded a musical um, chronicling the sort of life and work uh, of John Hume. And it, it's going to be called Beyond Belief, and it, it's co-produced by the John and Pat Hume Foundation in partnership uh, with the Playhouse, and it's going to be premiered and broadcast internationally in the Guildhall uh, on the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement uh, next April. Uh, so massive congratulations to John and Pat Hume Foundation, uh, massive congratulations to the Playhouse, uh, and massive thanks to the Arts Council. And when we're on the subject of John Hume, it's no secret that the Hume family have, have made the very generous gesture to loan the three peace prizes uh, to the people of this city and for them to go on personal or um, public display uh, in the Guildhall. Um, 
John Hume's the only person who won the Nobel Peace Prize, the Martin Luther King Jr. Nonviolent Prize, and the Mahatma Gandhi uh, Peace Prize. And they're meant to be on display in this guild hall. And this building will be unique across the planet that you will see these three prestigious Peace Prizes sitting together uh, on a display case. And we, we got a, an update in December of, of last year. Uh, that that was going to happen. So I would like to ask Aiden, if possible, uh, is there any update on, on progress with that? Thank you, Chair. Um, so thank you, Councillor Farley. I'm happy to confirm that uh, the peace prize is all been well, will be on display, um, hopefully by... <laughs> by early September. We, as you know, uh, members, as you know, approved that last December and we were, were waiting to have, as you know, we had um, the Robert Bala painting that was here until the end of June. So we, uh, and we have had some difficulties, I should say, in the, the, the peace prices require a specialist case. So we have had some supply difficulties, but the, the case is now on order and I understand it will be here within a matter of weeks. Um, and we are working on to finalise uh, with the Hume Foundation to finalise the interpretation panels that will go into that case. So we are hopeful. Um, we always said they'd be in over the summer, so um, all been well. Um, it'll just be a matter of weeks before those will be in. And I'm sure we'll be, we, we expect to do a soft launch um, of those in September. So we, we'll communicate that with members as soon as we can. As you know, we have the peace prizes in the collection and we have facilitated a number of, of visits and, um, and, and, and can do that if required in the meantime until they're on pair permanent display but as soon as that happens um we will be you know we'd be announcing that and promoting that uh, accordingly and so Sean Hargan thanks chair for letting me in and uh, I'm glad you mentioned uh foil cup uh, I was down there today in the guild hall square and the atmosphere was just electric I mean the the excitement uh made me want to be a participant um, and I did talk to a, a lot of ex-footballers who, who more or less is they would give anything to go back to the days when they were participating in, in tournaments like this but it's brilliant for the city it's brilliant for all the you know young people to be involved in and uh, I think it's the biggest one ever uh, it's the biggest foil cup ever and it's the first one in three years I think it's as you said John over three over 450 teams uh, I think there was 7,000 people in the Guildhall Square today, so it's fantastic, and I, and I think we can all wish all the teams the best. Um, and look, you know, the the the, uh, the coaches uh, do an enormous amount of work, uh, and the, the, this is, I think, a reward for that as well, because this is a kind of brilliant football spectacle, uh, as well as being brilliant for the city. So it, it it's uh, definitely fantastic um, and I appreciate that you're letting me in because what I wanted to speak about today is the um, the issue of the BT group workers going on strike on July 29th and August 1st and the council passed in my opinion a very good and strong motion at the full council last month uh, in support of workers demands and uh, I suppose we were all hoping that it wouldn't come to this that the that the workers um, balloting for industrial action would send a message to uh, its uh, the the BT group bosses that um, uh, would make them rethink their uh, pay uh, offers to workers but that hasn't happened um, and uh, workers now have decided that they're going to be taking strike action um, and so just that I know that the various Tories this week have been out to, uh, you know, knifing each other uh, for the top spot. And one of the things they've been saying is even a 5% pay increase is too much. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, workers are being forced to take action uh, in order to, to try and keep up with the cost of living. Um, but, the, but the CEO of BT Group um, made, got a pay raise of 32%. Um, in the last year. And I think that this is where the hypocrisy is uh, on full display. I mean, BT Group made profits of $2 billion, and their CEO, Philip Jensen, got a pay raise of 32%. But they're telling workers that 5% is good enough. Um, and I think that this is just an injustice. And this is how, um, this is actually how 
corporations like BT Group are driving the cost of living crisis. Uh, you know, huge profits, uh, rewarding their CEO a 32% pay increase, uh, and then compounding the cost of living crisis by uh, not giving workers a pay raise uh, on the level of infl inflation. Um, so I, I, I think that it's disappointing that uh, BT Group bosses haven't responded. Um, to to uh, workers' demand for a 10% pay increase, which I think is fair right now. Uh, but it's really just to say, look, I think our council uh, have unanimously backed the BT work uh, workers uh, at British Telecom and at uh, Open Reach. Uh, we should be standing in full solidarity when they go out and strike on July 29th and August 1st. And I, I've heard some uh, talk from BT Group uh, bosses that they're going to they have contingency plans, and I, I think uh, look we we as a council should be calling on them not to be using uh, replacement workers because that's one of the things that uh, trade unionists have been raising. I think that that would be a disastrous move by uh, BT Group um, to do that, um, uh, and I and I think that uh, it would be uh, ultimately unfair as well. So this is really just about uh, an update on. Uh, what, what the trade unions, the communication workers uh, unions uh, ha have done, um, and uh, also to send solidarity to the, the local uh, BT group workers in their endeavour to win a fair pay increase. Thank you, Chair. Okay, anyone else on that? Okay. I, I mean, I, I don't think anyone's in disagreement with what Councillor Harkin has said. Uh, there's a 96% voting for the strike within the BT staff members, sort of uh, tells us all we need to know. So I'm happy with what Councillor Harkin has said. Moving on now. Matters are rising. From the open minutes, item seven. Has anyone got anything in matters are rising? Want to raise anything? Chair. <coughs> Trisha Lowe. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, could I get an update on BC one zero two slash twenty two, please? I think it was the you know to do with um, families being able to access uh, different you know, uh, offerings down at the clubber and that. So I was just wondering, is there any um, update on that? Thank you. Yeah, I'll speak on that. Uh, we met with, uh, I think at the last meeting, members uh, talked about the the need for uh, the vendors on the day to provide some subsidies in, in the light of the, the financial crisis that we're having here at the moment. Uh, we met uh, with the first Fender of the big wheel, uh, and uh, to say we were flabbergasted would be another statement. Uh, we had the prices given three years ago, which were, I think, fourteen pounds for a family ticket, and they had announced that that would be increased to twenty-five pounds a family ticket. So meeting didn't last very long, uh, and I believe then after that we made a decision not to go at vendor just simply because 66% increase wasn't viable. We told them in the meeting that uh, people just couldn't afford that. Uh, they had been to other places uh, a couple of days before that, like Silverstone, but so that didn't uh, end very well. But we felt that we couldn't uh, have the big wheel in the city charging those prices. On the flip of that, we met with the other vendor, Collins, a local company. Uh, and when you talk about uh, local being best, it was a great meeting. They were very receptive to the idea. Uh, they provided discounts for family tickets and also were willing to do events for uh, cares and people with sensory issues. So it was a tale of two, two vendors, really, not a tale of two cities. So uh, from my own point of view, I just think the local provider was more than happy to hear our concerns and has reacted to that. Uh, if Eddie wants to add anything, but at this stage, I'm not sure if we have secured another big wheel, but we just couldn't uh, based on the prices they were looking. 
I'd add just for a couple of points, just for information. So, as you know, we put a minimum price into our, or put a, fam a family friendly price requirement into our tendering process. So, when we do procure amusements, um, I, you know, it's on the it's on the basis of a number of things, but we do that. I mean, those amusements are generate income, for, I suppose, for the festival. But we always stipulate that they mu that there must be a family price, in, a family friendly price quoted, um, which was the case. And I suppose one of the points that that Collins made to us when they met was that they were going to hold their price despite the fact that their costs had risen. So they were going to honour the um, the con so we would have contracted the the, the amusements, um, if you recall, for the twenty twenty festival as this is the sort of festival that never was in, in 2020. So Collins agreed um, that they would hold their prices uh, at that despite their rise in costs and they've also added as, as Councillor McGowan has said into that um, a family friendly hour, I think there's family friendly sessions and hours and they're doing also um, quiet time and uh, they've other specials for carers and uh, you know free rides for or free access for carers and everything else so um, I think um, the Councillor McGowan and the, the director were content following that, that 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 was a a good result they said given the the wider that given their own increase in costs which they highlighted as well that they're impacted obviously by the global pressures um they were you know they, they were very reasonable in the you know in, in what they proposed but it just is important to note that that is something that we do stipulate and we do stipulate that in the requirements for the vendors as for the other vendors for the food vendors that it is a family event and that there should be family friendly price and policy so so that is that is built in um you know before we, as part of the planning and as part of the procuring and tendering for all of those uh, providers. Okay. If I could just come back in, uh, Chair, thank you, Aiden, Aiden for that. And I take it that we haven't. Uh, there's there's no, no big wheel, sorry. No big yeah, wheel. But we've rejigged it, so I don't think anybody will, will notice there's no big yeah, wheel. Yeah, well, I suppose that is disappointing, you know, that 66% price hike uh, would just be, I suppose, out of the reach of many uh, people in the city and district. So uh, it is unfortunate and it was unfortunate as well that there was no movement within uh, the provider um, to do anything and to acknowledge uh, the situation uh, that many people find themselves in. But I suppose it is good, uh, Chair, that, um, you know, there has been concessions um, got uh, through the negotiations, but there's one that we're asking, I do think that it's very, very important that our communications team uh, get that out, that there are whatever these offers are, that, uh, that it's highlighted out there and that people are aware of them so that they can make their plans uh, accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, Councillor Derek. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Chair, for the opportunity to come in. Uh, following on from your previous novel, as it was, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. A um, couple of points. Uh, the Foil Cup was mentioned earlier on there, and like others, sincere congratulations to the organisers, and indeed, extra congratulations on that the, they're moving out uh, of the city, and, and I particularly welcome uh, the use of Cyan Mills tomorrow. Uh, as one of their venues. Another thing that I particularly welcome within the Foil Cup is the influx and increase in girls playing the game, uh, whether they're playing in specific girls teams or indeed mixed teams. I should declare an interest because my own club uh, have a team or a couple of teams down at the Foil Cup. But that is tremendous uh, to have that and to see that it's not just city based that they are moving out and I would encourage more of that. Um, on page 29, uh, Chair, similar to Councillor Logue, uh, I have brought in the issue of, I suppose, accessibility uh, for those who may not have transport, etc. And it is disappointing uh, that that nothing seems to have been done about that. Um, it would have been nice uh, if that accessibility to a rural population who pay rates the same as anybody else. And, you know, they deserve that accessibility. Uh, I know that TransLink are, have put some additional transportation on. I'm not sure that it goes to Newton Stewart or Plumbridge or 
or Castle Derg or even out to England, I don't know, uh, for, for the event. But that accessibility is something that irks with many in the rural community. Uh, of course, it's absolutely amazing uh, uh, for the city and district that, that these events are taking place, but they have to be accessible to all of our citizens, and, and that needs to be kept in mind. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Does, any, does anyone want to respond on that? I'm happy. You know, I know um, our own team did. We, we have been in intensive negotiations and discussions with TransLink about additional services. Um, and they may, did make an announcement last week. Now, I'm sure it didn't go as far as we would have liked. And probably certainly the services aren't going as far as um, Alderman Hussein or other members would like. But those that, that announcement was made last week. And those um, that information regarding the, the addition, some additional services, um, particularly later in the on the evenings, particularly on the on on this Friday night um, is available on our own channels and on um, and on uh, TransLinks as well. And just to come back to Councillor Logue's point, we are will be doing intensive um, communications on all of our social platforms regarding the accessibility um, for families, um, and that will cover traffic and travel, transport, and uh, family friendly pricing. And you know, there's a, there's a lot of initiatives this time around um, accessibility for families, things like refillable waters. Um, picnic areas, all the rest, so, so families aren't obliged to um, to use the, you know, some of the, the, the paid areas or the, with proximity to some of the more, more more paying areas. So there's a lot of that information that is available comprehensively on our channels and on our website. Thank you. I don't see any other speakers, so we'll move on to item eight. Uh, the City of Derry Jazz, and I'll hand you over as a lady. Yeah, so thank you, Chair. Um, members, the purpose of this report is to update you on the outcome of what was the 21st uh, City of Derry Jazz and Big, ba Big Band Festival and to seek your approval for to progress with the programming and promotion of the 22nd City of Derry Jazz and Big Band Festival, which will be in uh, May 2023. Uh, members, you'll know that the festival is a core event in Council's annual event calendar, and uh, it's a huge showcase for the city, um, and it particularly and its artists over the last 21 years. Um, over the years, it's hosted um, a unique combination of local and internationally acclaimed acts, and it has a, an excellent reputation um, as one of the most established and influent influential music events on the island of Ireland. 2022 was the 21st edition of the City of Derry jazz and big band festival and it saw the return of the festival to its regular format since um, the first time in three years you'll recall that we missed two festivals and um, two jazz festivals due to the pandemic so there was a great anticipation from visitors and local businesses in particular um, for this year's event it's estimated that over 70,000 visitors participated in this year's event um, bringing you know a huge raft of economic and social benefits to the region the highest number of attendees to date and occupancy peaked at our highest level ever of 99.11% or 11% on Saturday on the Saturday night of the event um, you know the the festival has has really grown. It, it includes jazz hubs um, and the the pure jazz offering that people will be aware of. But we now have a very popular schools education program that includes you know master classes and educational workshops. It's a huge showcase for the city um, with you know national and international artists performing. And 2022 saw a host of new acts come to the festival. Um, it's always a opportunity to platform our local jazz legends and the wealth of talented local music that we have. Um, it's a combination of local and international really that um, that makes the festival a success. Venues are very appreciative and supportive of the measures that have been adopted by Council and to ensure the development and improvement of the festival it's recommended that officers further explore opportunities with its partner to continue to grow with its partners to continue to grow the event. It is proposed in 2023 that this will include attracting and supporting new talent within the programme, ensuring performances are in suitable venues at relevant 
relevant times and continuing to develop the pure jazz element of the programme that continues to establish the event as a jazz festival. Um, the huge success of this festival can be attributed to the significant support provided by Council through its coordination, marketing and subvention role. Acknowledgement should also be given to the financial contribution made by the many local venues across the entertainment and hospitality sectors. Officers recognise that in order to keep the festival growing and developing, there will be a gradual need for transitional change some of which are already changes, some of which are already taking place that will lead ultimately to council playing a coordination and promotion role, subventing the higher profile acts and traveling bands and delivering on the marketing plan. It is the ultimate aim of the festival that the participating venues contribute fully to the performance cost of the acts within their premises. This is a longer term strategic aim in order to sustain the event and ensure that council's funding contribution develop, helps develop the event further. Council is also committed to continuing the close work and relationship with the many hotels and venues across the city and region to ensure that the event maintains its strong profile and attendance levels. To realise the strategic sustainability aim, it's proposed to reintroduce the yearly 5% reduction for Tier 2 subvention to venues um, for contribution to ACT fees, which remained at 8020 for this year's festival due to the effects of the pandemic within the hospitality industry. Officers propose that this rate now be set at 85.15 for 2023, that will see venues contributing 85% towards artist fees and council 15%. Um, council is also currently working with the Millennium Forum to secure a headline act for Jazz 2023. Um, a feedback survey was carried out following this year's event with the majority of venues contributing. The results show that venues were overwhelmingly positive about the event in terms of visitor numbers and spend. Post-event reviews from a number of key venues have confirmed that the promotion of the festival earlier this year and launching the full programme listing five weeks prior to the start of the festival has reaped positive results. The full details of the feedback are outlined in Appendix 1. For next year, officers propose to kickstart venue engagement in August by holding an open meeting to discuss arrangements, continue with the existing procedure for booking acts for 2023 in relation to size of venues and suitability, and also adhering to Council's booking policy issuing venue registration forms and advising deadline for data return, continuing to maximise the return on the Council's event budget and the venue's budget, to continue to research for and introduce fresh talent to the festival and encourage venues to book new talent, setting dates for venues to submit proposals and requests for acts. And there's full details of the marketing plan um, that with a total spend of 30,000 and the results that are set out in the report that I won't go through with you directly, but, um, but they're, they mean they're excellent results. Um, members, as outlined, it's, we are proposing, the, the key decision here is to propose to set, to set the rate now at 85.15 for 2023. And for 2023, it's proposed that officers work within the existing rates allocation um, for, the, for the festival, which is 120,000. A subvention budget of 15,000 to allow officers to secure headline acts in conjunction with our tier venues has, is included in that, in that overall figure. So members, you're asked to note the content of the report and to approve the planning, delivery and financial arrangements set out in this report for the 2023 City of Derry Jazz and Big Band Festival. Happy to take any questions. Okay, I have Rory and then Patricia. Yeah, uh, thanks Chair and thanks Aideen for the report. In terms of the Jazz Festival, obviously it's one of our premier weekends uh, in our cultural calendar. And I think everybody was glad to see it return uh, in a physical format um, after an absence of two years. So I'd like to place the congratulations to the SLP, to uh, the festival and events team, to the artists and performers, uh, and to the venues right across the city that helped to make it a resounding success. So we're happy to propose this item. We agree. Uh, that the 5% subvention reduction to ensure the future sustainability of the festival. Um, but I've got a question. You know, so we've got a rates allocation of 120K. And I note from the Saturday Dairy Jazz Festival website uh, that there's Guinness Brandon on there, there's Embrace the Giant Spirit Brandon on there. Um, could you give us a flavour of how much support we got from Tourism Northern Ireland and without breaking the confidence of any sort of agreement, um, how much Guinness contributed 
to the Jazz Festival um, and could you indicate whether those partnerships are going to continue for 2023 and if we've made any further efforts to get more uh, corporate sponsorship. Thank you. Um, so yeah, uh, the figure I think from Tourism Northern Ireland for last year under their sponsorship program was 15,000. Um, and yes, we will certainly be putting an application in again to that fund from Tourism, Tourism NI for the um, for the Jazz Festival. As you know, it sits it sits within their sponsorship um, program as opposed to the the other major international festivals. So there there is a cap on the on the amount of that that we can get from that fund. Yes, we do get sponsorship. From from um, from uh, Diageo um, from Guinness, uh, I'm happy to check on that figure. But um, we're always pushing for that to be to be more. We're always looking for sponsors. Um, we regularly meet with sponsors for for all of our festival events and have sponsorship proposals. It's a difficult one. Um, the it's always been the 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 jazz and the, the the sponsorship of the jazz festival has always been successful. It's a very it's a good fit. Um, so some sponsors, as you know, weren't a good fit. But yes, we we are we're constantly looking for looking for sponsorship, um, and I'm happy to provide. Uh, and probably it was remiss of us not to reference the income that uh, that comes in from other other funders. But the, you're right there, the two main ones, um, the tourism and I sponsorship and the and the corporate sponsorship as well. So, um, but yes, absolutely, that that is always a priority to ensure additional funding, not just for jazz, but for for all of our events. Patricia and then Sean. Thank you, Aideen. Um, first of all, I just want to say, look, I sit on the board of the Millennium Forum on behalf of Council because I just see it mentioned in this report that uh, you are working with them regarding the Headline Act. Um, and, and just to reiterate what the previous councillor has said regarding the report and the, the Jazz Festival, it was great to see it uh, come back. And uh, it has been a, a great success, and many, many people uh, look forward to it. Um, it's just, I suppose, on the, the proposal of the 85-15% split, um, that is for Tier 2, uh, tier two uh, venues. So I don't know if you would have the, these figures here, but see the Tier 1, the Tier 2, if you would have a breakdown in that, uh, what is the the amount allocated to each um, each tier, and has there been any you know discussions with those that have got previous uh, subvention in the tier two about the proposed uh, reduction uh, in the subvention, um, and I suppose. To given the you know council's most recent discussions, not only that that has passed the, this morning, and the, the motion that was brought to council regarding um, you know looking at all our financial outlays, um, I think it's going to be very. I know we have to forward plan for events and. Um, and uh, do things, but it is going to be difficult going forward to, um, I suppose, say yes to this budget and yes to that budget until we get a good look at exactly what direction council are travelling on. So I suppose just to get away, uh, those are the the two questions. I think had you seen any conversation with those in the tier two, the tier one. Um, uh, has, has there's no reduction in that been mentioned? Um, but um, can you just give us a breakdown of what the difference is between tier one and tier two? And to, uh, I suppose to you for a wee bit of more detail, how many venues got tier one and many got tier two? Um, right, I think that's it. Yeah, and apologies. That probably could have been clear in the report. There's really only one or two, ever one or two venues that are tier one, so they are not quite the headline, but they are two. They're event. They're venues of scale. 
So they tend to be, it tends to be an individual act procured for a venue that can hold more than four or 500. So there's, there's really, there's very few venues that that, 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 that is. Um, and, and that's a very specific, that they're, they're sort of the next down from headline. So, you know, I'll, I'm happy to go through that, but the vast majority of the subvention venues are um, tier two. So there's there's only ever one or two acts, and they would be. And in fact, this year I think we might have only had. I'll, I'll double check. I think we might have only had one tier one, um, tier one act. So they they're of scale. So there there's and that we we ring fence that fifteen thousand there to allow you know a couple of sort of sub headliners to come in. But the vast majority of the jazz program, when you see all the venues, are tier two. So they are the they are the eighty five fifteen. Um, and the, the, it's the act that the that the it's the act that the money goes on in the in the fifteen thousand, if you like. It's to secure an act that will raise the profile of the festival. But the vast majority of them are in that included in that hundred and twenty thousand, and they're they're tier two. We have been always communicated with them, and you'll know from previous jazz reports that we have been for the last number of jazz festivals we've been moving at reducing now taking aside the pandemic, we've been moving towards shifting this by five percent. So they're all aware that this is the direction of travel for the jazz festival, that the subvention will reduce because we know from our experience and, you know, from value for money perspective, that council's money is much better off spent on the wider coordination and marketing and promotion. Um, and at, at, and the, venues are, the venues are largely content with that. I mean, I'm sure they'd like a free act if they could get it, but they're largely content. They all do well out of it. Um, so, you know, that, that's they know that's coming and we've we've been communicating that with them over the last number of years um, now we'll continue we'll restart those conversations now very quickly and in relation to your your um question about the rates discussion yes we are mindful and this is subject to it being agreed within the rates process so it's just to give us the i, I suppose a, a a figure to work with and to continue with but we won't proceed um you know we won't commit out with of the rates process, so it probably should have been referenced in there to be subject to rates approval of that amount. Okay, thanks for that, Aidan. But I suppose just to touch on uh, Councillor Farrell's um, uh, comment on the, you know, the sponsorships, hotels, all the hospitality. Uh, venues are you know they are making a lot of profit i suppose uh from this weekend and i don't know if they um sponsor the you know especially the hotels within the, the city um so i do think the council i'm not asking that at the minute but you know if they don't i think they really need to be um yeah, providing a wee bit more sponsorship uh, to the council so that that we can become that this festival can become um, you know just coordinated and promoted by council in the long term. Do you want to come back on that, Eden? I just I was just going to say that many of the hotels are to, are those venues are the tier two. Um, you know, it's, it's the hotels, bars, they're, they're all a lot, many of them are included in the tier two subvention scheme. So I suppose that's where we're trying to <laughs> move them to, to increase the, that amount. But I appreciate your, your point re regarding sponsorship for the for the wider event. And yet I know then they do do well out of it. Councillor Harkin, and then I'd like to say a few words. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, uh, thanks, Aideen, for the report. And look, the Jazz Festival is fantastic. Um, and uh, it was great that it's uh, happening again and people were able to enjoy it. Um, but we are in a cost of living crisis. So I think everybody is scrutinising what we're spending money on. And that's what we've committed as a council. And I think if the total amount of money that we spend on the Jazz Festival is 120,000 out of rates, that's a lot less than what we spend on Clipper. Um, and it seems like there's an enormous um, 
uh, benefit to the district as a result. Uh, but I do think, uh, you know, going forward, that we have to be, uh, we've been reminded in our negotiations with the trade unions about uh, making sure workers get a uh, pay uplift of all the pressures that are on council, uh, which includes keeping the lights on, uh, because that's that, that's another additional pressure. So I think we should be thinking about how do we uh, push uh, others who are in a position to fund. So it seems to me we should be asking Tourism NA to quadruple their funding uh, for the for the jazz festival. It seems to me that we should be looking to the Diageo and Guinness, uh, who I'm sure are like many big corporations making huge amounts of money right now, to um, put more into uh, this great event that they I'm sure benefit immensely from. Um, so that we uh, are finding ways to reduce our, our uh, overall rate spend uh, on this. It seems to me as well that, like, look, uh, I, I don't see why council would be funding uh, uh, for, for for hotels that are turning over a big profit. I don't understand why we would be paying for X. Um, so you know, if we could get a bit more clarification on on that, uh, and I'm sure if uh, you know. The, if this is something that um, uh, some of the uh, beneficiaries of uh, think that it's uh, that, that can they take on uh, some of that burden um, so that it's lifted from from the council. It's a great event. We want to see it grow and strengthen, but we also have to be, I think, thinking now about uh, the pressures we're going to be under next year. Um, and uh, not just next year, but the coming years. It's about how do we get those with broader shoulders to take more responsibility for great events like the Jazz Festival. Thank you. Uh, I think it's clear from all members that that, that we all agree that Jazz Festival that has been a very successful one. But uh, just going through that report today, I don't think there's a, enough information there to allow us to agree the budget for 2023. We need a far clear breakdown. I'd like to know what percentage of the 120,000 is spent on tier one and tier two. I'd like to know who those venues are. Uh, I also would like to know is the 15 percent really uh, adding any value? Would the venue not book the act without that? Uh, I think we need a complete breakdown of the 120,000. Like Councillor Harkin said, I mean, we're heading on the uh, head ones, and I, I would like to know exactly what that spend does and have a far better, more detailed breakdown so we could look at that, because we're here as a committee, and I hope they scrutinise public money. I'd like to look at that and say, should we really be given that to a hotel to lay on a band on, on, on these times? So uh, I, I would like to see that before I would be willing to, to sign off on that. Uh, that would be my view of it. The information is not there. I mean, if I thought we were providing money to large hotels making huge profits, I wouldn't be agreeing it. I'd be telling them pay the hundred percent. If you don't want it, another venue will, and they'll get the business. So I just think we have to be very careful with public money, and I don't see enough detailed breakdown there to allow me to say with any shadow of a doubt that that's money well spent and spent well across every category. So until I see that, I wouldn't be supporting that. Sure. Yes, Derek. Yeah, just a quick comment. I presume that when um, uh, the, there is assistance to venues to bring in a band, a band uh, there's a requirement that there is no charge for those attending the venue. Uh, as most people know, I'm a, I'm a publican myself, put it, when you put on events, you do have to pay uh, for the music. Uh, but quite often, uh, the venue will charge their patrons. So I'm presuming if there is a subvention to assist the venues, that uh, the stipulation is that there is no charge to those attending. Thank you, Chair. Do you want to come on that, Aileen? No, very few, no charge on tier two um, on that subvention program. Anyone else to speak on that? Sir Hargan? 
Yeah, well, look, I, I would second your uh, proposal. Um, but is there a way that we can ask for tourism NI to, for example, quadruple its its um, its funding? Because uh, and that's not something that we can know for sure. But fifteen thousand for such a kind of big event that is a all Ireland event and, and maybe has a global focus. Um, that that seems like uh, at a time when uh, our council resources are being challenged. Where else, uh, specifically government, can we can we go for funding? And I and I don't think this is a, a kind of like we're going with a begging bowl. I think that we are in a uh, we're in a we're in a cost of living crisis that's putting enormous pressures on the council. So it's like who has who has broader shoulders? So it seems to me, uh, you know, I think you're you've probably knocked on a lot of doors, um, but if if uh, tourism and I is it. The Arts Council is it? Um, what department is it? Uh, and is there is there places that we've tried to get funding from in the past where we haven't succeeded? That maybe a bigger effort from um, the political parties here and others could assist because we want we want I want and I'm sure everybody wants to see the um, jazz festival continue to succeed, expand, and grow. Um, it is a, it is a brilliant festival. It's brilliant for the artists. It's brilliant for the people of our uh, district. It's brilliant for everybody that comes to it. But I just think that we're we are going to be asked questions about what we're spending money on, and um, so you know, uh, I I think that that's it's fair that we're asking we're we're raising this and asking these questions. Thanks, hello. Chair, you made a proposal and it has been seconded, but I, I just want to look, I understand that council officers need to be um, doing their work in advance. And, and there's, I suppose there's two asks uh, to this, um, this paper here. And the, the first one would be the 15,000 for the tier one. Uh, which uh, Aideen has says that officers need to try and secure now. And if, if we postpone that, that's going to go to, to uh, September. So if you don't mind, I would just like to maybe put away maybe a different proposal on asking that we go ahead with the 15,000 to uh, let officers go ahead and um, secure the Headline Act. Um, but on the 15, 85% split between the, the tier two, that we, we hold that and until we have more information on just who is uh, the recipients are of uh, these tier two uh, interventions. Um, because I do think that there is something in, you know, hotels who are, especially hotels who are, um, you know, they are doing good out of this festival, I suppose in bed nights and uh, their food, drink, the, you know, they're getting everything and then it's a bench and they bring in entertainment too as well. So I do think there is a wee bit of maybe more room for manoeuvre for the, the, the big players in that in this uh who, who get the most out of out of, out of the, the the jazz festival. How many second that yeah. It's raining. No, it's just how many second that okay. so we have a motion uh Council Farley. Farley. We currently have three proposals on the floor. We've got the one in the pack that I proposed. We've got the one that the chair has proposed that we don't accept this until we have more information. And then we have one from his party colleague, which is asking, so the 15 grand for tier one, we go ahead with it and we have a further discussion uh, when we get the detail on tier two. So we need to make up our mind here because you know every party or individual has a different view and the, there's different views within one party here. Um, so I get the concerns about 
the subvention the council is making. It's eighty percent at the minute. Um, we're, we're saying move that, or sorry, it's twenty percent at the minute. Let's move it to fifteen next year. That's fine. I think we all agree with that. I think some people want to go a bit further uh, for certain venues, uh, which is okay. Um, I'm happy to have that discussion if we get the breakdown. And what Councillor Harkin is saying is we should ask uh, Tourism and AED quadruple their contribution. Fine, we can ask them. They're not going to do it. Uh, but what I think would be really, really useful is to speak to Tourism and AED about all the funding they provide for this council area, not just looking at the Jazz Festival. Uh, because they provide money for Halloween, St. Patrick's Day, Clubber, loads of things. Let's not just focus on the Jazz Festival. Let's look at it as an entire package. Um, I'd be happy for that discussion. I think everybody would be happy to have that discussion. I don't know if Tourism and I would be happy to have it, but let's have it nonetheless. Um, so in terms of proposal, I'm sort of I'm gearing towards uh, Councillor Logue's proposal that basically defer this. Uh, we get a bit more detail in terms of the impact of Tier 2. Who benefits from Tier 2? Can some, can, can there be some sort of um, adapt, adaptations made to that, that some smaller venues can contribute 85%, bigger venues with bigger capacity, um, Go the whole hallway, hundred percent. Is that is that doable? So we defer it. We get a further paper in September. Uh, we make a decision on all of it in September, um, and we get a meeting with tourism and I. Chair, can I come in? I'm just going to. I know I'm not allowed to propose things, but might suggest one of you that you remember that we would bring, if you allow us to scope, uh, taking all the, the points, um, allow us to bring back a further paper with more detail, allow us to have some discussions with the venues, and if necessary, maybe bring together the cultural working group to discuss this with a view to bring in a detailed paper with um, a more refined proposal, taking on board all of the comments that uh, members have shared today um, in relation to the tier, the, to the subvention rate in the tier one and tier two, um, and, and allow us, I suppose, to consult with, with some of the, the venues and, and you know, develop some proposals that we can bring into, maybe into the working group, and then with a view to bring in a report in, in September. Mm -hmm. um, we can certainly have that conversation, just to go back to uh, Councillor Harkins, we can certainly have that conversation with Tourism NI, but it is important to note that this is part of Tourism NI sponsorship scheme, so it is, it's, it's a little bit like our grant aid scheme, it opens at a certain time, it's a certain set criteria, um, so it's not just a matter of saying can you increase it, it's that's probably where that com the complexity of that, but um, I'm, I'm not sure where the proposals are at in relation to discussing with Tourism NA. We can certainly have our own discussions with them um, about that, about how we look at increasing the, the subvention. It doesn't meet, the, the, although the Jazz Fest is very important, it doesn't meet the criteria for the international fund. It doesn't have the scale, doesn't have the number of visitors or the international reach that the, the Maritime Festival would have or Halloween would have, which is why it isn't in that. There is a cap. Um, I think it's 30,000, but similar to our own grant schemes, very few of those um, sponsorship uh, awards that have gone beyond, you know, beyond halfway into that just because of the pressures on that fund. So we're tied into that. Um, we're tied into that scheme, but we'd certainly take that on board. But um, I'm happy to work up a revised paper for September and uh, and bring it to the working group if that's agreeable. OK, is that OK, members? Yeah. I suppose just to, just to clarify everything, there was three proposals. So um, um, myself and yours was very, very, uh, there was very little, I suppose, in it. And the reason why I proposed we go ahead with the 15,000 was because I just wanted the um, allow officers to continue on their work. So maybe if we got a wee bit of clarity on that, is, is um, agreeing that today, is that need it today or can it wait to September? 
And just to clarify for Councillor Farrell, no one's saying the Jazz Festival is not uh, an important part of our program. What I'm saying, there's a paper here that's talking about Tier 1 and Tier 2. I'd like to know who they are. I'd like to know who we're giving our repairs money to. If it's a Tier 1 organisation, it's a large organisation and it's making lots of profit, I would be reluctant to subsidise an act there. I would, just in the times that we're on. But I think we as members need to ask those questions. Where we're putting this money? It's the ratepayers' money, who we're giving it to and why. And a, a detailed breakdown showing the total cost of this event, what we bring in in sponsorship, what we pay out across the venues, Tier 1 and Tier 2. There's nothing wrong with that. That's what should be before members today to vote on. If that was here, we would have voted on it. It's not. It's not clear to me who are the recipients of ratepayers' money. That's all I'm saying. Uh, Patricia's amendment, I actually agree with it, but I might not do it for Tier 1 or Tier 2 because we don't have the information. And if there's a large venue in this city getting subsidised, they run the event, which I believe they, sh they should be running, paying the 100%, and I'll say that. I think we should all be uh, very... Uh, we should all scrutinise those type of things. That's all. But as for Jazz Festival, I love it. But uh, And as for the uh, Sean's request about, that would be, in a, in a perfect world, that would work. But tourism and is under the Department for Economy. The DEP are not on the Assembly. It comes back to that. I want to make a political message. But it, I would say they would be reluctant to look at those budgets because the, the Minister's not there. Thank you. Item, can we move on to item nine then, please? Chair Morris, I was looking to get Sorry, in there. Uh, Morris Devaney, sorry. Come on. <laughs> Thank you, Chair, for that, for uh, allowing me in. Uh, and look, I would agree, your party would agree with the deferral um, to get more uh, definite information on the tier one. And I do agree, look, we're in um, financial crisis at the minute, the cost of living crisis. And yes, there's a working group set up to scrutinise what council spends. And it's vitally important that we start now uh, and scrutinise every pound that's spent and see where we're going with it. And, you know, at the end of the day, I think you're quite right. Uh, if their business, they're receiving um, financial help uh, and they're big businesses, um, uh, I don't believe they should be getting any help. But look, uh, at the end of the day, as long as uh, as long as Irene is happy enough that she continues the discussions with the groups that may be coming uh, and stuff like that there, because I do know when you're booking festivals and stuff like that there, you have to be in early to get the, the right groups and the right acts to come to that. As long as she would, uh, Irene, you'd be happy enough with that, we'd be happy enough for a deferral into September. Thanks, Chair. Councillor Doyle. Thank you, Chair, and very briefly, just to absolutely endorse uh, your own comments. I think that's the right approach. Um, I'm wondering, just in terms of the Tier 1 um, venues, when we get this report back, is it possible for us also to inquire with those venues um, how many tickets they sold, um, what the cost of those tickets were, how many people actually attended? Uh, because I'm conscious that um, we also have a role in... in uh, three agreements with some cultural venues in the city uh, where we are actually already um, subventing them to, to, to a degree. Uh, so we'll be interested to see that in the mix as well. Thank you. Uh, Erin, you want to come on and then I'm going to move to item nine. Uh, just to say, if we're content the Jazz Festival is going to proceed in 2023, we should be okay. If you're if you're happy, we, we can pursue um, the relevant discussions around around the majority of the Jazz Fest without actually contracting anything or, or making any firm decisions until September. So I'm happy to look at a further report coming back with the detail requested. Okay, members, we'll move on to item nine. Uh, I think it's Kevin the leading that. Thanks, Chair. Uh, members, uh, the purpose of this report is to update you on future employability skills and training funding opportunities and to seek your approval for Council to lead in the coordination of, coordination of some pre-application stakeholder engagement. Um, members will be well aware of the role that Council um, uh, plays within the employability skills and training ar arena um, uh, mandated through the Strategic Growth Partnership and 
and in particular the Education and Skills Delivery Partnership. Um, uh, the ESDP uh, is, plays a vital role in the delivery of Council's uh, statutory compu uh, community planning function. The partnership brings together stakeholders from right across the Education and Skills spectrum as listed below in 2.3. Um, Council's skills team is tasked with providing strategic leadership, management and delivery across three key areas, one being the Education Skills Delivery Partnership as outlined, two um, leading on the delivery of the Labour Market Partnership and three on embedding employability and skills within the overall City Deal um, uh, project uh, over the common period. Um, uh, in terms of the uh, Education Skills Delivery Partnership itself, members can see that there are uh, four subgroups delivering across a number of different sectors um, within the economy um, and also uh, delivering on um, uh, leading on the ESF uh, forum, which is a forum that allows ESF providers to come together to coordinate um, their activities, to facilitate discussion around the key challenges that they face in delivery and also to plan for the future in terms of trying to um, look at sustainable funding um, horizons going forward. Members will also be aware that Council has provided in excess of about a million pound in match funding to ESF projects over the past five years. That's leveraged in, in excess of six million in investment and skills right across the Council uh, area. Council has actually committed a further 130,000 for the year 2022-23 uh, this year um, to ensure that there is a short-term um, continuation in what was ESF type project delivery. Um, uh, the Labour Market Partnership was set up uh, just over this last year and Council is beginning to really populate that and deliver on um, DFC's uh, commitment to really localised um, skills interventions around uh, supporting the economically inactive, long-term unemployed, and really trying to help local industry um, uh, meet their skills needs. Um, that intervention has become really acute over the last couple of years, as there's been a obviously post-COVID. There's been quite uh, the economy has been experiencing major skills shortages across loads of those sectors within which we are delivering. Really importantly, um, uh, council skills team are embarking on um, trying to identify um, gaps in terms of uh, the skills needs going forward, trying to understand what the skills of the future are and what, how, um, uh, how the innovation projects that are being delivered through City Deal can really deliver at all levels. And in particular, looking at um, how this can be done in an inclusive manner. Um, uh, in, in relation to uh, the, the wider uh, city deal sort of project itself. So it's about trying to coordinate those three areas in a, in a, in a really joined up uh, fashion itself. Members will be aware that ESF funding actually ceased last year, but there was a DFE extension up to 2023. Um, uh, and uh, this obviously presents a number of, ch uh, presents considerable challenges on a number of different levels here in the council area. Clearly, economic inactivity remains well above the Northern Ireland average and unemployment is above the, nor the Northern Ireland average sitting at what was 4.8% in June 2022. In terms of the area itself, uh, throughout the last ESF funding round, um, the council area benefited from about 17.5 million in funding. This equated to 11.6 uh, million in funding for access to employment, 5.9 for social inclusion, and the balance for skills for the remaining balance was for skills for for growth. Um, the impact of this loss of funding could be um, significant um, right across. Um, the employability sector, in particular, looking at um, the, match, the, the match funding that we provide to community training organisations um, and, and education and training providers. Um, so what Council Skills team have been doing is trying to work with stakeholders um, in terms of making sure that there's line of sight of successor programmes, um, which will hopefully come in um, to try to plug the gap in funding that exists post post ERDF, post ESF really. Um, so the two major funds that are in the pipeline are the Peace Plus 
theme 2.3 now that's separate from theme theme 1.1 which um the peace team within council are delivering on um but 2.3 um really equates to potentially around 10 million over the program period for the northwest area um and will focus in among other areas um specifically around addressing um evidence skills gaps looking at productivity employment looking at cross-border labor mo uh, mobility um, and, and quite importantly, uh, focusing on um, those core employability issues within which ESF would have traditionally focused on. Less clear is um, UK share prosperity. Nonetheless, it still re represents a significant funding commitment. How that will be delivered, whether it's at a very local level or at a NA wide level, um, is, is, is yet to be fully fleshed out. However, the, the intervention areas are certainly um, important to this council area, so boosting core skills and supporting adults to progress and they work, targeting adults with no or low level qualifications and skills and upskilling the working population. Um, uh, key to this will also be supporting people furthest from the labour market uh, itself. That's those economically inactive we talked about earlier in the paper. Um, so, uh, in order to try to coordinate and facilitate a more joined up approach, um, DCSDC's skills team will coordinate and facilitate stakeholder engagement throughout its various established delivery mechanisms, the ESF Forum, the Education Skills Delivery Partnership and the Labour Market Partnership itself. This, uh, this approach will help to reduce duplication of effort um, uh, and try to align project proposals, ensure alignment with emerging priorities at council and statutory level, for example, city deal and the emerging opportunities will, that will come from that, and ultimately maximise the investment in skills throughout this council area itself. Um, so uh, there's no financial implication to this, but the recommendation is that members agree to endorse this coordinated approach um, and uh, allow council skills team to commence pre-funding development work focusing on potential district-wide, uh, should say wide, uh, Peace Plus and UK Share Prosperity bids. Open us up, Patricia Logue, as indicated. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Kevin, uh, for that report. And uh, it has a great concern that there is going to be a loss, or has been a loss, of 17.5 million. And I suppose that's the direct outworkings of Brexit that we are uh, beginning to see now and, and all the promises that were made uh, regarding, uh, you know, why we should leave Brexit and that, you know, it's not, we have to realise that we are not going to get anywhere near that 17.5 million. And I think as all councillors, we see and realise the benefit of these ESF uh, schemes that were rolled out throughout the whole council district and how many people progressed uh, on the employment that they wouldn't have had the opportunity to do if they hadn't went through uh, these schemes. Um, I, I do think that um, there, there needs to be a, a good bit of work done regarding, you know, um, going forward to ensure that there isn't any duplication of services and duplication of ask, and we need to maximise uh, the amount of money that um, this council district can get uh, to try and enable us to go forward. And we have said within the figures, um, the unemployment figures, we need this fund now more than, than ever. We need this scheme uh, more than ever. Um, so I would just like to um, support uh, the proposal going forward. I think uh, the ultimate um, aim of the, the proposal would be in 3.6 of the, the, the report. Um, uh, good luck with, uh, you know, looking in for those uh, funds, the Prosperity Fund and the, the Peace Fund. But as I said at the beginning, it's not going to touch the 17 point million, 17.5 million that has been lost uh, because of Brexit. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Farrell. Yeah, uh, thanks, Chair, and thanks, Kevin, for the report. I have no questions. You'll, you'll be glad to hear. So happy to second this item on behalf of the SDLP. Obviously, we have major concerns that 
ESF or a sort of replacement funded program from DFE uh, is, is going to end in March. And there's nothing concrete in terms of a replacement at the moment. Obviously, there are opportunities around Peace Plus skills development, uh, but we have a very hazy understanding of the UK Shared Prosperity Funds. You know, we have no idea of council allocations, timelines, processes. Uh, it's, it's a bit up in the air at the moment, but you know, we agree with the approach, we, we feel it as uh, prudent to commence that development work, um, to sort of scope out district-wide projects, and that there's no duplication uh, across those as well. So ultimately, you know, we want skills programs operating across the city and district, which enhance the skills base and uh, improve employability options. So happy to support the proposal, happy to second the proposal. Thank you. Can I just make a few comments? Uh, I think everyone is, sees the importance of skills. Uh, from, my, from my point of view, I, sometimes I get a bit uh, confused because as a council, I know Kevin mentioned the DC, SDC support team. Uh, I, I would like to couple this when we do the financial review as well and have a look at what council's role is in the provision of training. Because it's clear resources are going to be a, a lot more scarce. It's clear that Brexit was a bad idea. Uh, but we have a college up the street, and I, I think we should bring in the college and see what they're actually doing. Uh, I also think we have to look at what our councils are doing in terms of delivery models. Uh, I think any resources we pull under this council should be put straight back out. Council being a lever to draw down funding is fine, but uh, I, I would welcome an opportunity to, to sit down with council staff and have a look at the, the number of people we have employed in this area. And that, that's something I think we're going to do anyway in terms of the financial review. There's no sense leaving money if it doesn't go out there to create the skills. But I think it's not a bad idea to bring the college in, see what their objectives are in terms of training, because training is not really a function for local authorities. Uh, last time I checked, it's it's the college up the street that's meant to be providing the skills and the training across the city. But it's it's something here I see in the presentation that uh, that we're seen as a strategic partner. And I'd like to challenge the college up the street. They should be leading on this. We should be following on this. So we shouldn't be leading. In my personal opinion, local authorities should not be leading, leading on skills. Uh, and I would like to know if there's a repair implication in this when this ESF money runs out. Is there staff we have doing this that we, we might have to pay for? Because again, we're all talking about money and we've got to make best use of those resources. So anything we leave it on, the only thing I would add, Kevin, is anything we leave it on, we should put the majority of back out into the community and not have it in-house. Thanks. Want to come on, that, Kevin? Or? Uh, well, in relation to this, this is obviously around the facilitation. I mean, the role that that we play is is very much as an honest broker, and it's about being able to bring together, you know, different stakeholders right across the city and district. And specifically, um, when we talk about Peace Plus. I'm sure the college will be able to submit bids and in, in, into Peace Plus, but also others will be wanting to submit bids. It's not focused solely on FE or HE delivery. Um, and in fact, the SUPB want to see coming from this region is a coordinated bid, which is multi-stakeholder in nature. So what they're asking for within the program itself, and specifically around Peace Plus anyway, is a coordinated bid. So that's that's really what we want to try to ensure. And there's no, I don't think what we're looking to do here is get into delivery mode, actually, in relation to Peace Plus. What we want to ensure is that there's a really coherent and compelling bid that comes in from right across the Northwest region. I think what we have also is that ability to expand right across the border. Um, and the fact that we've got the Northwest Development Growth Partnership set up, the fact that we've got these this great relationship at 
Donegal County Council, the New Atlantic Technical Technological University, um, allows us to be able to do that. So the more cross-border in nature, the better in terms of trying to deliver on the Peace Plus. And I think that what the specifically around the community and voluntary sector and what community training organisations are saying to us um, is that they have a really important role to play in skills delivery, specifically around employability, um, and looking at those sectors with which are really, you know, experiencing the skills shortages. So I don't, I don't disagree with you. I mean, it's not that we're looking to get involved in delivery. Um, uh, but what we do need to do, we do need to be able to res be resourced correctly to be able to pull together proper, um, coherent and strong bids that can maximise any investment coming into the city and district with the North West Regional College being really, really front and centre. I completely agree with you uh, around that. Um, and I think that they do play a really good role as it is. They're uh, important players within the Strategic Growth Partnership um, itself. So this is just about coordination at this stage, um, not about necessarily delivery. Okay, so moving on then, no other speakers? As a proposed and seconder for that, so... I'll propose. Oh, sorry, yeah. yeah okay, Thank you. So the next four items are for information, if anybody wants to raise anything, or we'll just... Five items. So the next five, sorry. Number 10, item 10, 11, 12, 13 and 14. Okay, so we move on to the confidential for a decision. Propose those five. Yeah. For information. Okay, for information. I propose we go on the confidential. So proposal again, Rory. Second there. That, okay. Connor. Just give it a second to drop off live. Just drop off there. Yeah, no, no, they'll they'll drop it off. Yeah. 